Am I to become profligate as if I were blonde? Or religious as if I were French? Each time my heart is broken, it makes me feel more adventurous. And how the same names keep recurring on that interminable list. But one of these days, there'll be nothing left with which to venture forth. Why should I share you? Why don't you get rid of someone else for a change? I am the least difficult of men. All I want is boundless love. Even trees understand me. Good heavens. I lie under them too, don't I? I'm just like a pile of leaves. However, I have never clogged myself with the praises of pastoral life, nor with nostalgia for an innocent past of perverted acts and pastures. No. One need never leave the confines of New York to get all the greenery one wishes. I can't even enjoy a blade of grass unless I know there's a subway handy or a record store or some other sign that people do not totally regret life. It is more important to affirm the least sincere. The clouds get enough attention as it is and even they continue to pass. Do they know what they're missing? Uh Uh-uh. My eyes are vague blue like the sky and change all the time. They are indiscriminate but fleeting, entirely specific and disloyal so that no one trusts me. I am always looking away or again at something after it has given me up. It makes me restless and that makes me unhappy but I cannot keep them still. If only I had grey, green, black, brown, yellow eyes, I would stay at home and do something. It's not that I am curious, on the contrary, I am bored, but it's my duty to be attentive. I am needed by things as the sky must be above the earth. And lately, so great has their anxiety become, I can spare myself little sleep. Now there is only one man I love to kiss when he is unshaven. Heterosexuality you are inexorably approaching. How discourage her? Saint Serapion, I wrap myself in the robes of your whiteness, which is like midnight in Dostoevsky. How am I to become legend, my dear? I've tried love, but that hides you in the bosom of another, and I am always springing forth from it like the lotus the ecstasy of always bursting forth, but one must not be distracted by it. Or like a hyacinth, to keep the filth of life away, yes, there, even in the heart, where the filth is pumped in and courses and slanders and pollutes and determines. I will my will, though I may become famous for a mysterious vacancy in that department. That greenhouse. Destroy yourself if you don't know. It is easy to be beautiful. It is difficult to appear so. I admire you, beloved, for the trap you've set. It's like a final chapter no one reads because the plot is over. Fanny Brown is run away, scampered off with a cornet of horse. I do love that little minx and hope she may be happy, though. She has vexed me by this exploit a little too. Poor silly Chechnall, or FB as we used to call her. I wish she had a good whipping and ten thousand pounds. Mrs. Thrale, I've got to get out of here. I choose a piece of shawl and my dirtiest suntans. I'll be back. I'll re-emerge, defeated from the valley. You don't want me to go where you go, so I go where you don't want me to. It's only afternoon. There's a lot ahead. There won't be any mail downstairs. Turning, I spit in the lock and the knob turns. Hello, and welcome to Words That Burn, the podcast taking a closer look at poetry. This week's poem is Meditations in an Emergency by Frank O'Hara. 
and I think it wins the title of longest poem to appear on the podcast. But when I read it in preparation for this week, I couldn't resist including it. So if you'll bear with my indulgence and listen along, I think this one is really interesting. Frank O'Hara could be described as a sleeper poet of the 1950s. That's not to say that he didn't achieve the same level of fame as the likes of John Ashbery or Allen Ginsberg. Indeed, he was more prolific in many cases, most of his work being published posthumously after friends and colleagues went through countless drawers and boxes to find the hundreds of scribbled poems that he had created in his time. During his lifetime, he did not publish so much, his work reaching many more people after his tragic death on Fire Island in 1966. It's not hard to see why Frank O'Hara rose to prominence. His work is all at once accessible and yet completely alienating. The speaker here seems to be engaged in a very distressing stream of consciousness. It's all there in the title, Meditations in an Emergency. This was changed from the original title, Meditations on an Emergency, because Kenneth Coach suggested that it gave a greater sense of urgency, and I'd be inclined to agree. Here, O'Hara presents us with his trademark style of a rambling collection of imagery and illusion all woven together in a bizarre tapestry that can only work for Frank O'Hara. This kind of bricolage or melding together of things comes from O'Hara's own obsession with painting. He was a member of the New York School of Poets alongside the likes of John Ashbery and Barbara Guest. That group had sprung from the meeting of groups of painters. Eventually, these artists would draw those who sought a more experimental form of expression. O'Hara was among them. And when we look at this energetic poetry, we can understand how brushstrokes and expressive streaks of paint might have gone on to influence him. This poem, in fact, was written in the wake of O'Hara's separation from the painter Larry Rivers. O'Hara had been enamored and in love with Larry Rivers for many, many years. Unfortunately, in 1957, when this poem was published, they separated for the final time. The stress of their on-again, off-again relationship, too much for either to bear. This left Frank O'Hara devastated. We should, as always, separate the speaker in the poem from the artist themselves but that would be a betrayal of Frank O'Hara, I think, because so much of his poetry was lyric and personal. During his lifetime, he garnered most praise for his famous collection, Lunch Poems. A series of sometimes long, sometimes short poems written on his lunch break and traversing New York City. It gained him quite a bit of praise at that time and was published after this poem was published. It's interesting then that in certain verses here, he rejects the notion of the pastoral and the nostalgic. Other critics since his death have named him the master of the urban pastoral because of his amazing ability to conjure all at once a completely objective and subjective window into New York in the 50s. Yes, he describes the cities with an almost Joycean accuracy. But at the same time, he infuses the character of that city with his own experiences. This has been noted by critic Hazel Smith, who writes fascinating essays on how Frank O'Hara created what we call hyperlandscapes or psychogeography, the landscapes that have been shaped by those that live in them. She writes, on the one hand, O'Hara's are the most topographical of poems and represent a highly delineated locus the grids, landmarks, and routines of New York become the poem as map, filtered through the consciousness of the poet. On the other hand, O'Hara's poetry also involves a radical questioning of place through a de-centered subjectivity. That is almost certainly what is happening here. Frank O'Hara was always capable of rendering the grim reality of New York, but quite often chose to be romantic about it instead basking in the security that the urban landscape gave him, often placing himself in opposition to rural or country life while doing so. But here, this grand emotional event has unraveled him. 
He is seeking safety in New York, but cannot find it to the point that he chooses to leave by the end of the poem. I have split the poem into five distinct sections. Taking a look at each one, I've tried to separate them based on the giant leap in imagery that occurs. We could almost look at them as five separate poems, starting with the first. Am I to become profligate as if I were a blonde, or religious as if I were French? Each time my heart is broken, it makes me feel more adventurous. And how the same names keep recurring on that interminable list. But one of these days, there'll be nothing left with which to venture forth. Why should I share you? Why don't you get rid of someone else for a change? I am the least difficult of men. All I want is boundless love. Even trees understand me. Good heavens. I lie under them too, don't I? I'm just like a pile of leaves. There is a wonderful desperation here. A plea to his lover to reconsider. To take him back. He is being forced to reassess his own identity in the wake of this emotional travesty. Am I to become profligate as if I were a blonde or religious as if I were French? There's something very tongue-in-cheek in using such a verbose term as profligate, which means wasteful, and to equate it to a blonde. Religious as if I were French is to me a reference to Joan of Arc and her zealous devotion to the Lord. He makes a heartbreaking statement. Each time my heart is broken, it makes me feel more adventurous. But parentheses makes that an untrue statement. The same names keep recurring on that interminable list. The men he returns to when his heart is broken to feel anything but loss. He recognizes, however, but one of these days, there'll be nothing left with which to venture forth. The next two lines are where all the desperation focus. Why should I share you? I am the least difficult of men. All I want is boundless love. There is inherent contradiction in each of these. I am the least difficult. All I want is boundless love. O'Hara would tread the line between these contradictions with masterful balance, and they are littered everywhere in his poetry. They are one of his defining features, the ability to invoke so many things in stark opposition and yet find a way to tie them together. He is so simple that even inanimate objects like trees can understand him. But then that is taken from him again as he said, good heavens, I lie under them too. I'm just like a pile of leaves. There is a sense of worthlessness in these lines, a man forced to take stock of his value in the wake of being rejected by another. He rallies in the next section. However, I have never clogged myself with the praises of a pastoral life, nor with nostalgia for an innocent past or perverted acts in pastures. No, no one need ever leave the confines of New York to get all the greenery one wishes. I can't even enjoy a blade of grass unless I know there's a subway handy or a record store or some other sign that people do not totally regret life. It is more important to affirm the least sincere. The clouds get enough attention as it is and even they continue to pass. Do they know what they're missing? Mm -mm. Within this small stanza, is one of O'Hara's most famous lines of poetry. I can't even enjoy a blade of grass unless I know there's a subway handy or a record store or some other sign that people do not totally regret life. I was taken aback at how much I related to this. Sitting still is an endeavor in modern life and apparently it was the same in the 50s. Here, O'Hara steals himself against the sentimentality of the first few lines. I have never clogged myself with praises of pastoral life, nostalgia, innocent past. This is not a man who believes in halcyon days. He can move on. He does not need this. Nor does he believe it. He waxes lyrical, as he often does, 
about the wonderful structure of New York City. He claims that it is important to affirm the least sincere. The clouds get enough attention. This is as good a window as we will ever get into Frank O'Hara's philosophy. He truly believed that for literature to progress, it had to move away from the romantic lofty language of high literature. He said, I don't think of clarifying experiences for anyone or bettering, other than accidentally, anyone's state or social relation, nor am I for any particular technical development in the American language, simply because I find it necessary. What is happening to me, allowing for lies and exaggerations, which I try to avoid, goes into my poems. I don't think my experiences are clarified or made beautiful for myself or anyone else. They are just there in whatever form I can find them. This goes some way to explaining this rambling poem. He is laying out his emotions as he finds them, and this is the form they take. It is an incredibly honest style of poetry. The next stanza is one filled with melancholy, gentle self-loathing. My eyes are vague blue like the sky and change all the time. They are indiscriminate but fleeting, entirely specific and disloyal so that no one trusts me. I am always looking away or again at something after it has given me up. It makes me restless and that makes me unhappy but I cannot keep them still. If only I had grey, green, black, brown, yellow eyes, I would stay at home and do something. It's not that I am curious, on the contrary I am bored, but it's my duty to be attentive. I am needed by things, as the sky must be above the earth, and lately so great has their anxiety become, I can spare myself little sleep. The contradictions I spoke of a little earlier come back in a relentless list living up to the statement that they change all the time. Indiscriminate, fleeting, specific, disloyal, always looking away or again at something. He uses the subjunctive to say if only he had another eye colour as if that would make a difference to his personality. It is more rationalisation from the poet. A hope that things could be different if only he could change one thing. We as the reader feel this is hollow. We know that nothing would change if Frank O'Hara had brown eyes or green eyes. He would be just as heartbroken. Again, the pathetic imagery hinted at by the pile of leaves returns when he says, looking again at something after it has given me up. O'Hara feels that he is always the one to be left behind. I would stay at home and do something is possibly a reference to the collection of lunch poems and wanderings around New York. They were Frank O'Hara's own personal odyssey. He would travel to various locations in the city and have lunch. Using this as a context to inform us, we might guess that he was out and about to avoid being home and alone. He once again dips into the bag of rationalization as he says, it's my duty to be attentive. I am needed by things as the sky must be above the earth. He is intentionally vague here. We will never know what things need him. We can imagine that they are his own anxieties. And lately, so great has their anxiety become, in other words, his anxiety, that he cannot sleep. Frank O'Hara was a proud gay man and never made any attempt to hide the fact. In the third stanza, he uses this in a very witty fashion to talk about the toll that heartbreak is taking on him. Now there is only one man I love to kiss when he is unshaven. Heterosexuality, you are inexorably approaching. How discourage her? Saint Serapion, I wrap myself in the robes of your whiteness, which is like midnight in Dostoevsky. How am I to become a legend, my dear? I've tried love, but that hides you in the bosom of another, and I am always springing forth from it like the lotus, the ecstasy of always bursting forth. 
but one must not be distracted by it. Or like a hyacinth, to keep the filth of life away. Yes, there, even in the head, where the filth is pumped in and courses and slanders and pollutes and determines, I will my will, though I may become famous for a mysterious vacancy in that department, that greenhouse. That tongue-in-cheek tone has returned. So jaded in love, so heartbroken is O'Hara here, that he will leave homosexuality behind. Heterosexuality is hot on his heels. The parentheses return here, and there is yet another small tongue-in-cheek moment. How discourage her? There is something intentionally provocative in making heterosexuality a feminine trait, one that would be traditionally associated with homosexuality. He goes on to invoke some unusual things. Saint Serapion is a reference to a famous painting by Spanish artist Francisco Zubaron called The Martyrdom of Saint Serapion. We can see the white robes that O'Hara references clearly. There are many reasons O'Hara would choose to invoke this saint and this image. In the 1950s, being gay was to invite persecution. There was no choice. There is a witty comparison between martyrdom and the gay lifestyle at that time. He then asks a question of his lover once again. How am I to become legend, my dear? I've tried love, but that hides you in the bosom of another. Every time Frank O'Hara tries to express himself, tries to draw himself nearer to his lover, his lover retreats, steps back away from him. And yet, Frank O'Hara has no choice but to continuously throw himself forward, to spring forth from it like a lotus. The ecstasy of always bursting forth, being exactly who he is, but one must not be distracted by it. He then references hyacinth. That choice of flower is not taken lightly. The hyacinth in Greek mythology is a symbol of devotion to love beyond death. A small message to his lover that O'Hara's affection is not entirely gone. The way in which it keeps the filth of life away is because in the Victorian period it was strongly associated with joy. The thing that keeps the filth of life away is joy, the balm to a broken heart. Yes, there, even there, in the heart, where the filth is pumped and courses and slanders and pollutes and determines. This is an aggressive rolling list of another part of O'Hara that he would change if he could. The filth he is referring to here, in my opinion, are his emotions, his longing, his want, his desire to be loved. They are causing him pain. He follows his heart everywhere. He has no choice. He must spring forth. He says, I will my will, though I may become famous for a mysterious vacancy in that department, that greenhouse. Destroy yourself if you don't know. He answers his own question. How am I to become legend, my dear, by being the man without a heart, a mysterious vacancy? And he condemns the reader who might question his metaphor. Destroy yourself if you don't know. Destroy yourself if you don't know of love. From there, he steals himself once more from the very sentimental dialogue he just engaged with. It is easy to be beautiful. It is difficult to appear so. I admire you, beloved, for the trap you've set. It's like a final chapter no one reads because the plot is over. Fanny Brown is run away, scampered off with a cornet of horse. I do love that little minx and hope she may be very happy though. She has vexed me by this exploit a little too. Poor silly Chechenal, or FB as we used to call her. I wish she had a good whipping and 10,000 pounds. Mrs. Thrale. This entire section borders on farce. He pays a compliment to his former lover. It is easy to be beautiful, but difficult to appear so. Problem is that his lover was able to do so with ease. 
and so O'Hara was trapped from the beginning. He says now, looking back at the entire relationship, that it's like the chapter no one reads. No one will care but him. His lover has moved on and he is left with the strange tying up of loose ends. The Fanny Brown exploit is a parable. Fanny Brown is run away. My lover is run away. Scampered off with a cornet of horse. I do love that little minx and hope she may be very happy though. She has vexed me by this exploit a little too. It's exactly what has happened to O'Hara. He is vexed by how he has been left, but he loves that person so deeply he cannot help but want the best for them. He quickly comes to his senses in the final stanza and says, I've got to get out of here. I choose a piece of shawl and my dirtiest suntans. I'll be back. I'll re-emerge, defeated from the valley. You don't want me to go where you go, so I go where you don't want me to go. It's only afternoon. There's a lot ahead. There won't be any mail downstairs. Turning, I spit in the lock, and the knob turns. He must leave his beloved New York. It is too filled with painful memories. He chooses to leave in the most melodramatic Hollywood fashion possible. He throws a shawl over his head and smeared sunglasses to escape and not be recognized in the New York streets. This kind of strange reference to Hollywood glamour is very common in his work and is littered throughout lunch poems. He knows he will not stay away forever. I'll be back. He will re-emerge, but sadly, he expects to feel the same loss in the valley, Los Angeles, that he has felt in New York. He will re-emerge defeated. This is a final act of defiance against his lover, who doesn't want his companionship. So now, even with their absence, he will defy them. There's a small note of hope. It's only afternoon. There's a lot ahead. There won't be any mail downstairs. It's another contradiction. It's only afternoon. There's a lot ahead. There is hope for O'Hara here. There may be better things to come. But there's not much to look forward to as there won't be any mail downstairs. No correspondence. No communication. He's alone. Turning, I spit in the lock and the knob turns. That final act of self-deprecation, of debasement, is towards the apartment he is leaving. I love this poem. I think it is exemplary of all the things that made Frank O'Hara one of the greatest poets of the 20th century. It is chaotic and sprawling and yet at the same time there is a relatability here that few people could conjure in such a host of disparate images so many things are referenced here greek mythology victorian farce a kafka-esque obsession with his own body and yet somehow it still works o'hara never leaves his reader without a thread to follow things never seem so completely at odds with each other. Even trees understand me. Good heavens, I lie under them. The reference to trees then leads into his mention of the pastoral, which in turn transitions to the blades of grass, possible reference to Walt Whitman. He finishes that particular stanza by talking about the clouds. In the next, he mentions that his eyes are vague blue, like the sky. Then he goes on to talk about how he can spare little sleep, and the next section begins with the phrase unshaven, a traditional symbol of a bad night's rest. These small threads allowed readers to engage with what would otherwise be incredibly alienating works. It is a very honest reflection on the desperation we sometimes feel in losing someone we adored the rash, melodramatic actions that we find ourselves swinging between. On the one hand, we wish to be stoic and strong. On the other, we would give anything to have that person back. It is an astounding poem, and I urge you to read it yourself. What did you think of the poem? 
I'd love to know. You can get in touch with me in a couple of different places. You can find me online at www.wordsthatburnpodcast.com. You can find me on Twitter at Words That Burn. You can find me on Instagram at Words That Burn Podcast. All of these are linked below in the description. If you enjoyed this or you know someone who would, please consider sharing it with them directly or leaving me a review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find the show notes to this episode down below in the description. They come with complete references to everything talked about in this episode. This week's episode was written by me, Benjamin Colopy, and the music in this week's episode was made by Scott Buckley. You can find his work linked below. Join me in two weeks' time, where I'll be taking a look at the poetry of Ada Limon. Thank you for listening once again. I hope you enjoyed, and you'll hear from me soon.